Well, good evening. Good evening. It is not often that I come to a missions conference and am assigned a topic that relates to slaying dragons. But I am excited to deal with this topic and these issues, these dragons that we face, these errors that we face. And, and what I want to do is I want to focus on a passage of scripture that really puts um, all of this in one place. There are a number of errors facing the church. And when we talk about missions and the threat to our mission, a lot of these errors <laughs> sort of culminate in errors about manhood, womanhood, marriage, and the family. So many of them center there. So with that in mind, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter five. And we wanna look at uh, some familiar passages of scripture, but look at them perhaps through a different lens. Look at them through the lens of uh, the errors and the attacks that are focused right here and the answers that we have for those errors and those attacks right here. Always, also, I think it's very important for us to look at this in terms of missions because oftentimes when we talk about missions, we talk about the establishment of the Lord's church, when we talk about advancing the Lord's church, especially when we talk about breaking new ground with the Lord's church. One of the things that we often fail to keep in mind is that when the gospel breaks forth in cultures, not only are we dealing with people coming to faith in Christ and perhaps leaving, you know, other religions and, and finding Christianity, but inevitably we talk about dealing with family structures in the midst of broken, sinful, pagan cultures that find this as foreign as the gospel. And so this is, this is important ground to cover. As we go through here, we'll look at these places where the wars and the errors are found. We'll begin in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands. We can just stop there. <laughs> we, we can stop right there. We're already at war. We're already at war with our culture, right? I, I, I didn't even finish the whole verse. And we're already at war with our culture. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Let me just point out, right? Let me just make my point here. Number one, this verse, obviously, when we read this, we think about feminism, right? And feminism's war with the gospel, feminism's war with marriage. Great. But do we also consider the fact that in the modern neo-Marxist culture where everything is seen through the lens of power relations and this oppressor-oppressed paradigm that to the modern, to, to the neo-Marxist, marriage is part of this oppressive paradigm. It, it, it is essentially the oppression of women, if you will. So there we have this issue of feminism, we have this issue of Marxism, but then we also have this issue of same-sex marriage right here, because we have, we have wives submit to your own husbands. Wives and husbands. A marriage is made up of wives and husband. A marriage is made up of a wife and a husband. Are you smelling what I'm stepping in? Here's another battleground. A husband is only a husband if the husband has a wife. And a wife is only a wife if the wife has a so a wife can't have a wife. And a husband, watch this, can't have a husband. And 
And them's fighting words today. They absolutely are. So we haven't even finished the first verse. And we see here that we're at war. But dare we forget that we're also dealing with the idea of wives as women and husbands as men, which means that we actually believe that there is something ontologically unique about manhood and about womanhood. And that God who made them, made them male and female in his image. Again, another battleground, okay? Before we even get out of verse one. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. There's the ultimate battleground. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and as himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Well, well now, now we're entering in a, into another area of conflict, and this area of conflict is any idea that people need to be made holy. In, in anything that posits the idea that there could possibly be any sort of sinfulness or imperfection in any person other than a white, male, heterosexual, cisgendered, able-bodied, native-born, dot, 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 all the way down to Christian, right? That there, could, that, that, that there could possibly be a need for salvation, sanctification, correction, a movement away from unrighteousness toward righteousness. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, wow, there are those binary terms again, and hold fast to his wife. Here's what's interesting. Again, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Men have wives, women don't. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Here's why this battleground matters. This battleground of biblical manhood, womanhood, and marriage matters because it's referring to Christ and the church. It's a profound mystery that points us to the reality of Christ and the church points us to the reality of the redemption that we find in the gospel. So, so we cannot abandon this ground. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. So there it is. And what I want to do in the time that, that I have allotted is to address these battles and to demonstrate how this text beautifully and clearly and unequivocally addresses these battles and why they're so incredibly important. Let's look at the first one. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It is clear here that the Bible teaches us that there is order within the context of marriage, that there is headship and submission within the context and the confines of marriage. 
And wives are called to submit themselves to their own husbands as to the Lord. This is not something that we ought ever to back away from, although many have backed away from it. And so we have a, a, a two front war on this issue. Number one, we, we have a war with the culture at large that hates the patriarchy. Not, not, not patriarchy, the patriarchy. That's how the educated people refer to it. They hate the patriarchy because the patriarchy is evil. And so we have the world out there, we have the culture out there that, that hates the patriarchy. And so we have you know, women, for example, who decide that, you know, because they hate the patriarchy, when they get married, they're not gonna take their husband's name, right? I'm an independent woman. I don't take the name of that man. I'll keep my father's name instead. So, that's, and so, so there's that, there's that battleground and, and we need to deal with that and we need to address that and we will. But there's another battleground and that's the battleground within our own camp of the people who've now decided that because the culture out there is at war with the patriarchy, what we'll do is we'll say, no, 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 no. That whole patriarchy thing, that's a misreading of the text. That's not biblical Christianity. That's, that's fundamentalism, right? That, that, that's, that's those people over there who, who, who hate women and you know, who, who, who want to dominate women. That, that's not the way we see it in the Bible. They argue that basically this is a, or male headship, the concept of male headship is a product of the fall. And because it's a product of the fall, that when we find ourselves in Christ, we, we no longer experience this kind of headship. Listen to the evangelical feminist view, and that's what they call themselves, not me, the evangelical feminist view of Genesis 3.16. Genesis 3.16, by the way, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Listen to this from Ada Spencer and beyond the curse. Her curse now was to be ruled perversely to long for her husband and he to rule over her. She would want to be dominated by her husband and he would submit to this desire. Hey, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it, right? <laughs> She would want to be dominated by her husband and he would submit to this desire. God does not command Adam to rule or govern his wife. Rather, the curse is Eve's. The ruling is a consequence of Eve's longing after the fall. Okay. Same phrase is used in the next chapter. Genesis chapter four. Verses five through seven. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It's desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So according to Ada Spencer, what's happening is sin is longing to be dominated by Cain. And Cain has to submit to sin's desire. <laughs> the Council on Biblical Equality. Sounds like a good thing, right? Listen to their statement here. Point number one. Scripture is our authoritative guide for faith, life, and practice. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I want to get my amen there because it's downhill from here. <laughs> Two, patriarchy, and then in parentheses, male dominance. Right? So they have to redefine patriarchy. Right? Patriarchy means male leadership, male headship. 
patriarchy, patriarchal cultures, right? Men are the heads of their, their family. Um, you, 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 you define people's lineage you know, through that, that male lineage, that male headship, that, that's patriarchy. They say patriarchy, male dominance in parentheses, is not a biblical ideal, but a result of sin. Patriarchy is not a biblical ideal, but a result of sin. And again, they're defining patriarchy as male dominance. Patriarchy is an abuse of power, taking from females what God has given them, their dignity and freedom, their leadership, and even their lives. How about that? Listen to this from the United Nations. The family is in institution that has historically been a stronghold of patriarchy and embodied men's social power and domination over women. Patriarchy in its wider definition means the manifestation and institutionalization of male dominance over women and children in the family and the extension of male dominance over women in society in general. That's how they're defining patriarchy. And so evangelical feminists are right along with, you know, the UN and liberal, you know, institutions and, and everyone else in, in redefining this idea of patriarchy, redefining this idea of male headship as this sinful thing. And their argument is that that headship is something that comes as the result of the fall. And now that we are in Christ, that curse has been reversed. That, that's, that's the argument. Right? Again, that's what I've read. And I, I just want to make sure that you understand that because I got questions. Because if you remember... The first part of the curse for Eve was pain in childbearing. So if they're right and the curse has been reversed, <laughs> why? Why, why, why are y'all acting like it hurts, Christian ladies? <laughs> we should be able to find out who's really saved in the maternity ward, right? <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. Not to mention the fact that you have Adam's headship before the fall. The man was made before the woman, male headship. The woman was made for the man, male headship. I will make him a helper suitable for him, male headship. The woman was brought to the man, male headship. The woman was named by the man twice, male headship. And in case that's not enough, in Romans chapter 5, Paul makes it very clear that sin entered the world through one, not couple, but one man. Even though she ate first, sin entered the world through Adam. Why? Male headship. Also known as patriarchy. Please use the word, people. Please use the word. Don't run from the word. Embrace the word. If for no other reason, then the, it just messes with them so much. <laughs> There's another way that people try to get around it. The evangelical feminists also try to make a, a, a more sophisticated argument here from the text. It goes something like this. You know, in, in, in the Greek New Testament, you have the verb in 22 borrowed from 21. And so in 22, you just read wives to your own husbands, right? The, the submission is inferred from verse 21. And that's really important because in verse 21 of Ephesians 5, it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So their argument is that based on that, that what you have is mutual submission in the New Testament. 
Again, and this error is, it's, it's, it's airware. Again, not everywhere, airware. That's beyond everywhere, okay? It's airware. People, yeah, verse 21, you got mutual submission. So God calls us to mutual submission. Several problems with that. Problem number one is the verb that's used there. The verb that's used there, it's a military term. It's a military term for submission. And here's a newsflash. I don't know if you've ever been in the military. You don't even have to be in the military to know this fact that I'm about to tell you. In the military, submission works in only one direction. Amen? It works in only one direction. There's another issue. And that is, verse 21 is the end of a paragraph. Verse 22 starts a new paragraph. It's, it's the end of a sentence and the end of a paragraph. And I don't care what language you speak, you can have a language that goes from left to right or right to left, uh, but you do not have languages that go from back to front. You don't start at the end of a paragraph. You have to start at the beginning of a paragraph, which means that if we're going to understand verse 21, we have to go all the way back to verse 15. And this is important because it's going to incorporate a whole lot of these other errors that we're dealing with. So when you go back to verse 15, an amazing thing happens. In beginning at verse 15, it's going to, it's going to open up like a telescope. You have three contrasts. On the third contrast, you have three commands. And on the third command, you have three contexts, okay? Three contrasts, on the third contrast, three commands. On the third command, you have three contexts, all right? This won't hurt. Let's look. But it's really important because it's gonna, it's gonna open up even more of these errors that we, that we deal with. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. That's a contrast. Not this, but that, right? Now look at verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, right? Not this, but that. That's a contrast. That's contrast number two. Here's contrast number three, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. There's the third contrast, right? We following? Okay? There's the third contrast. On the third contrast, you get three commands and they're related to the third contrast. Look at verse 19. So he says, be filled with the spirit. What's that look like? Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with all your heart. This is, a, this is an evidence of the spirit filled life. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Worshipful. Prayerfully thankful. This is, this is, this is a spirit filled life. And then thirdly, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is evidence. Your, your submission to the authority that God puts in your life is evidence that you are yielding to the spirit of God. Now on the third contrast, we got three commands on the third command we get three contexts. Watch this, 522, wives submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. 6-1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 6-5, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. 521 is not the umbrella for 522. It's the umbrella for 522 all the way down through 6-9. And, and that introduces another set of errors and controversies. Look at 6.1. Children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. We hate children in our culture. We do. We hate them. We hate them so much we murder them in the womb. 
But we'll get back to that. Let's go back to where we were in 522. So we see that there's this error. There's this two-pronged error. People are at war with us. They're at war with us because they hate male headship. They're at war and they hate male headship because they hate God's headship. They're at war and they hate male headship because they're in rebellion against the Lord. They're in rebellion against Christ. And because their desire is to blaspheme this glorious picture of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. But the text could not be clearer. But let me also point this out. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The Bible doesn't say all women submit to all men. Amen, somebody. (laughs) The Bible doesn't say all women submit to all men. This is about order within the context of the marriage relationship. My wife is called to submit to me. To me as her husband. This is not about value. It's about order. Anything with two heads is a monster. Amen? I always say, if you you find something with two heads, you either kill it, or if you can catch it and put it behind glass, make people pay to come see it, right? (laughs) This is about order, not value. Again, since he uses this military term, um, I think it's appropriate to use a military illustration here. If you have, if you have two people in, in, in a unit, in a military unit, and one of them is an enlisted man. He's a sergeant. And he's been there for 10 years. But the other one is an officer, right? You got a young lieutenant who's been there for, for, for 10 months. Well, well, who's more valuable? It's not a trick question. It's the enlisted man who's been there for 10 years. Amen? It is. But in terms of order, who's superior? The officer who's been there for 10 months or 10 weeks or whatever. And for the sake of order, when the officer gives the order, what does the more valuable enlisted man do? Salute and execute. And if he doesn't, Everything breaks down because it's not a question of value. It's a question of order. Women are not less valuable than men. When, when Adam sees Eve, he says, this is at last bone of my bones flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. These are statements of her equal worth and value and standing before God. It's incredibly ironic that cultures impacted by biblical Christianity are the places in the world with the freest safest, most protected and cherished women on earth. It's also the place where the women complain the most about the patriarchy. In the words of that theologian Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. It's not about Value, it's about order. And then it says, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives aren't called to submit to their husbands because their husbands deserve it, have earned it, or are worthy of it. But in spite of the fact that we'll never deserve it, we'll never earn it, and we'll never be worthy of it. Because this is about submission to the Lord. Because remember, there is this glorious imagery of the relationship between Christ 
and his bride, the church. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. So, so there's that issue. And, and, and we are confronting great error here on this issue. This issue of biblical womanhood and the true worth and value of women. And, and, and I think what we're also seeing is we're seeing the monstrous results of a culture that no longer views women as the weaker vessel to be protected. Which is why you have Aaliyah Thomas, who was able to swim for the men's team at Penn for three years, right? And, and then declare that he's no longer a man, but a woman, and then all of a sudden go from the middle of the pack to a national champion and take the crown away from an actual woman, and then to literally add insult to injury, be proclaimed by some as, as a woman of the year. Or Fallon Fox. This is a while back, but Fallon Fox was an MMA fighter. Yeah, you know where this one's going, huh? An MMA fighter who underwent a transition and got into the ring with a woman and fractured her skull. Or a young man in California who assaulted a woman some years back in a bathroom, in a public, public bathroom. And later on, he goes to trial for this assault. And when he goes to trial for this assault, he decides that suddenly he's going to transition and he's going to identify as a woman. Why is this important? Because the assault happened when he was 17. His conviction happened when he was 23. Because he was 17 when the assault happened, he went into a juvenile facility and because he identified as a woman, this 23 year old man went into a juvenile female facility. This is what we, this is what we do in the name of equality for women. We brutalize them rather than protect them. Verse 25. And, and in verse 25, I'm just, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read this. The reason I'm going to read this, just, I just want you to hear it. I just want it to wash over you because our culture says that our perspective is wicked and it's evil and it's detrimental to women. It says that our view is the problem. And we've got, we've got Christians who are now trying to back away from patriarchy back away from, from male headship because we're ashamed. We're ashamed of this. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. We could, we could stop right there, say amen and sing a hymn, and already be better than the world. Amen? Because the world's not saying that. The world's not saying, you know what? Men, love your wives. The world is saying, just take all you can from women. Use them. The text says, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Even, it's even defining it, right? Because we don't, we, don't we don't even know what that is, okay? 
We, we, we've, we've succumbed to these Greco-Roman myths of even what love is. So the text is going to, be, going to clarify that. Husbands, love your wives. Not, he doesn't say you have to have, you know, these whatever. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, like this, this is how husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. She's not just mine, she's me. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. That's what the world says is hatred toward women. Offensive domination and abuse of women. And if it is, then that means Christ is an abuser of his bride, the church. That, that's what they're saying. Why am, I, why am I making that argument? Verse 31, therefore a man should leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So if this is a picture of evil, wicked patriarchy, then the gospel is a picture of wicked, evil patriarchy. And we have blasphemed Christ's love for his bride, the church. That's why we can't give this ground. That's why this matters. When, when we switch this around and change this up and it, it, it becomes a free-for-all and you can define it any number of ways that you want to, then what we're doing is ultimately we're blaspheming this glorious and beautiful picture of the love that Christ has for his bride, the church. That's why this is so wicked and so sinister. You can search the world over and you will not find anywhere a more glorious and beautiful life-giving picture of the relationship between men and women. You're not going to find women more cherished and yet our culture is at war with this. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respect her husband. Now let's go to 6-1 and, and let's look at the other thing, the other error. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. We've turned this on its head. First of all, your children are not yours. Children obey the state, for this is right. We've even moved from that. Children obey your feelings, for this is right. And then on top of that, we say, parents obey your children's feelings, for this is right. So if Johnny comes to you and says that Johnny is now Susie, it is your job not to instruct Johnny, that he's not Susie, but to instruct Susie that you affirm her as Susie. That's your job. Your job is to obey, to submit to what it is that your child says that he or she is. Sounds like the same twisted logic of the evangelical feminist. And it is. Parents, not only do you no longer have the duty and obligation, but it's being argued that you don't have the right. 
to lead your, parent, your children in this regard or in many others. In fact, it is seen as an act of abuse to do so. Verse two, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Again, this is hugely problematic because the idea of children submitting, obeying their parents and children honoring their parents, th th this idea reeks of patriarchy. This idea reeks of hierarchy Be because it is patriarchy and it is hierarchy, but to the world that we're living in, this world gone mad, patriarchy and hierarchy are evil by definition. That, you, that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. And then it gets worse. Look at verse four. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now we've lost our ever-loving minds. <laughs> teach your children what to believe and teach your children how to behave. E essentially, that's what's said here. Parents, it's your job to teach your children what to believe and teach your children how to behave. And in the day and age in which we live, this is tantamount to child abuse. In the day and age in which we live, our job is to listen to our children and follow their instructions. If it, even if it leads them all the way to hell, and the only thing that you can do to be condemned in this regard is to tell them that the hell that they're headed for is hell. These are the battlegrounds. These are the battlegrounds. Th this is where the war is being fought. These are errors that are actually creeping in. And we have people who name the name of Christ who are beginning to parrot these things and who are beginning to condemn those who call it out, who say that there's just two sexes, there's just two genders, who say that marriage is between one man and one woman, a husband can't have a husband, a wife can't have a wife, who say that one of the defining characteristics of marriage is the potential for the union to produce children. Again, I mean, this is, this, is, this, is, this is crazy talk. And people try to make ridiculous arguments. Say, oh, oh, well, yeah, well, you want to argue, you know, male-female marriage because, you know, of the potential for reproduction. But, you know, what about couples who are, who are beyond reproduction? No, no, no. What we're arguing is not that every marriage is going to produce, produce children. We, we, we know that that's not always the case. But what we're arguing is that when God designed man and God designed women, he designed them in such a way that man and woman comprises a union that can re reproduce and bring life. And therefore he instructs us as to what marriage is supposed to be comprised of. Those two pieces that come together and we know that the rightness of those two pieces coming together because when they come together, by definition, they're the only union that can produce life. That's what we're arguing. And again, it's a war zone. My children are my children. It's a war zone. My children are not wards of the state. It's a war zone. My job is to instruct my children. 
not to take instruction from them. It's a war zone. If Johnny tells me that he's Susie, I, I, I'm going to tell Johnny, no, actually, you're not. You're Johnny. Listen, I have more tolerance. And I do. I do have some tolerance. I just, <laughs> contrary to all the rumors, right? I do have tolerance. And I do want people to like me. I get that one, too. I'm not a sociopath. I do want people to like me. If they don't, it's okay. But I, I do, I do, I do want people to like me. But, but, but I have more tolerance if Johnny comes to me and says, I'm Batman. <laughs> Johnny comes to me and says that, and he go, I, you know, I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm the Joker. <laughs> Riddle me this, Batman. We can go there, right? Johnny comes to me and says, I'm Susie. I'm going, you might be Batman, but you're not Susie. And it would be as ridiculous for me to follow through on the Johnny, you're really Susie. Take this drug, have this operation as it would be for me to follow up on the Johnny, you're really Batman. Let's alter your life. Let's alter your body chemistry. Let's, offer, let's alter your body itself. And then let's make everyone else around you be in on it or be condemned. These are just some of the errors that we're facing. But they're critical. And I want you to notice that they're, they're all centering around the same place this God-ordained institution that has been given to us not only for the perpetuation of the race, but also as a living, breathing, God-honoring, Christ-exalting picture of the relationship between our Lord Jesus Christ and the bride for whom he laid down his life. The bride for whom he lived a perfect sinless life in her place and in her stead. The bride on whom he imputed his righteousness. The bride whose sinfulness he took upon himself, whose penalty he took upon himself on the cross. and died, was crucified, and buried, and raised again on the third day to vindicate her. That's the picture that our culture is blaspheming and calling us to blaspheme along with them, and some Christians have decided that they will oblige. a bridge too far. We have a beautiful, glorious truth. Let us proclaim it faithfully. Let us live it faithfully. Let us defend it faithfully. For our Savior's sake and for the sake of generations to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy toward us. We recognize that we are in the midst of a pitch battle. But this battle is essentially not ours. The world is not at war with us, it's at war with you. 
And it is only because we're yours that they war against us. Grant by your grace that we might be faithful. Grant by your grace that we might be bold and courageous. Grant by your grace that we might be a glorious, beautiful, winsome picture even in the midst of our great opposition. For we pray these things and ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.